His colors make it John and me. We're tight as fuck. We share everything. The pain, the joy, whatever there is, we share it. Our greatest love is football. We stand by our team and we stand by our mates. To have a last look at each other before the fight breaks out. Let's have it, let's fucking have it! I can't explain that feeling. My name is Tommy. This is my story. Maybe you lot don't give a fuck, but I do, because this is my life. This is my life. And our bond would never be as strong if we hadn't fought together, side by side, like brothers. We do it for each other. We do it for the boys. That's when you find out what you're worth, if you got what it takes. Would you leave a man behind? Because in our world, that doesn't exist. If somebody goes down, you pick him up or you go down with him. Welded together by broken knuckles and knocked out teeth. You might lose, and that happens sometimes. But it is, as they say, taking part that counts. Knowing that together you've cheated death. When she hit the fan, you stood your ground. I can't even explain that feeling of fear and excitement you get just before you go into battle. For that split second, time stands still and nothing else in the world matters but you and him. You or him, you or them. Cut off from reality, free from all the shit that gets shoved down your neck day in and day out. To clench your fists without even realizing it. To find yourself so deep in it that there's no way out but to fight. Then come the roar, the fast hands, the cold floors and the sweet taste of blood in your mouth is like a fucking orgasm. We love to fight because that's what we're good at. Go in hard, get in first, come on! How the fuck am I supposed to change my life? Hey? Amputate everything. Sometimes I get so frustrated. I get so frustrated, I just fucking hit myself in the face. No, I know that's not clever. And I can't sleep because my head is filled with so much nasty shit. I think of the things I've done. The people I've hurt. Physically. Mentally. I made them scared. I took their freedom. And then I think of the things that could have happened. And that just, just cuts through my head like a fucking chainsaw, fucking ruins me. Am I just a bad person? Hey? Yeah. Maybe I am. Yeah, there are moments that I think, you know. Yes, this useless piece of shit that I don't even deserve to live. But I was good, you know, before all that. I was good. Right from wrong, that was my thing. I never gave in. But now, a thousand light years later, Crossed so many lines, I don't even know if I could find my way back. Like that evening, that evening. What a fucking way to separate right from wrong. Marking this territory that doesn't even exist, defend something that isn't even.
I don't know. But what the fuck should I do instead, eh? I am what I am. Thank you, Ulf. I just heard a reading from the play Top Boy by Theater Fryshuset that has been played all over Sweden and abroad with more than 300 shows. I think I've seen Top Boy like 20 times, maybe, and I still can't get enough. It's a very good play. Thank you, Ulf. An overwhelming majority of all violence in society is committed by men, whether it takes place in homes, on streets, in wars, sport arenas, or in politics. In order to understand violence, we need to begin our understanding of what it means to be a man. What happens when men in power positions dismiss sexual harassment as locker room talk? Why is it mostly women who are speaking out against violence? And what role does masculinity play in the growing right-wing extremism globally? To help us understand these issues, we are, we are very proud to present Dr. Jackson Katz, editor, author, filmmaker, and cultural theorist, who is internationally renowned for his pioneering scholarship and activism on issues of gender, race, and violence. In 1993, Dr. Katz co-funded the Mentors in Violence Prevention, MVP, program at Northeastern University Center of Studies of Sport in Society. The MVP program is one of the longest running and most vi widely influential sexual assault and relationship abuse prevention programs in North America and beyond. Among its many accomplishments, MVP introduced the bystander approach to gender violence prevention field. Katz is one of the key architects of this now broadly popular educational strategy. Dr. Katz has served as guest speaker consultant and subject, subject matter expert to various international organizations, including the Inter-American Development Bank, the World Health Organization, and the United Nations. He and his colleagues have been working closely with Swedish NGOs and agencies for the past 15 years, including Men for Gender Equality and Salar. Please give a very big hand for Dr. Jackson Katz. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Donna. Thank you all. Good morning. Good morning. This is a great uh, opportunity and honor for me, so thank you to the organizers of this uh, great conference to ask me to be part of it. Certainly at the beginning of the conference, it's a great honor. Um, I'm sure it's going to be a great conference throughout the day, and hopefully some of my ideas and um, points will be um, duly noted throughout the course of the, the, the rest of the conversations. At least that's my hope. I, I also want to say before I plunge into my um, prepared uh, remarks that uh, I've, I've enjoyed this past week working with Men for Gender Equality, men who does incredible work and all throughout Sweden. Um, and, and I've worked with them for a number of years and I, uh, I just wanted to give them a big shout out and a thank you for all their work and I think we all owe them a debt of gratitude for their continuing activism on, on issues of, especially on issues of engaging men in the prevention of men's violence against women. So thank you to men. And some of my colleagues from uh, men will be joining me on the stage after my talk for a panel discussion, which I look forward to as, as well. Um, Forgive me. In my, uh, as I get older, I need my uh, technology to assist me in doing what I used to do without uh, such uh, 
help. Let me begin by saying that it's absurd to think that anyone can have a deep and productive discussion about human rights and not talk about gender. Gender should be close to the heart of human rights discourse, but not for the reason many people think. Many people hear the word gender and they think it means women, as if gender issues equals women's issues. In recent years, as the transgender movement has progressed, more people are associating the word gender with the idea of gender identity, which we know occurs across a wide spectrum and is not confined to a strict binary definition. Nonetheless, for decades in human rights discourse, the concept of gender has been understood to be referring to women, and discussions about human rights issues that had a gender component were generally speaking about the ways in which women were affected by human rights violations. One of the most famous declarations of this, about this link came when Hillary Clinton declared in the 1995 Beijing Women's Conference that women's rights are human rights. Of course, I agree, and I fully acknowledge that it is critical to talk about women as women as they are affected by human rights abuses. But I want to talk about another aspect of gender and human rights that has not received the attention that it deserves, and that is human rights abuses, and Donna said this in her introduction, human rights abuses across the world are overwhelmingly perpetrated by men and the state actors that um, represent uh, patriarchal states. So we can't talk about human rights and not talk about gender, and we can't talk about gender and not talk about masculinities, because human rights abuses are overwhelmingly perpetrated by men, and men as actors of patriarchal states. To me, it's just been incredible to watch human rights discourse over the past 20 or so years, eliminating the centrality of gender when gender is at the heart of human rights, and human rights uh, violations in particular. I just read an article just yesterday about hate crimes in the United States, my country, which I'll get to maybe a little bit in a little while, in the pathetic state of affairs in my country. But it was about hate crimes and how they've increased dramatically in the past two years. I wonder why. Um, and um, not one mention of gender, not one mention of the gender of the perpetrators, just all this passive voice about people who are being abused, Jewish people like myself, I'm a Jew, Jewish people who are being abused, women, you know, transgender folks um, and others, but no perpetrators, nobody's doing it to them, it's all passive, it's happening to people, it's happening to women, it's happening to Jews, it's happening to uh, progressive activists, it's happening to Muslims, but nobody's doing it to them the absence of the active agent in the linguistic practice of talking about human rights abuses or hate crimes is so problematic and needs to be corrected. Talk about accountability, there's no accountability built into the very language. And I have a, part of my work has been for a long time, scholarly work and activist work has been about trying to help people think about how language, the language that we use itself keeps us from being honest and also from naming the problem. And I'll just, I'll just give you a couple examples because I can't resist. We talk about how many women were assaulted rather than how many men assaulted women. We talk about how many teenage girls got pregnant in Sweden last year rather than how many men and boys impregnated teenage girls. I mean, even the term violence against women is problematic. You won't hear me say the term violence against women without uh, problematizing it or complicating it. Why? There's no active agent in the sentence. Violence against women is a bad thing that happens to women, but nobody's doing it to them. They're just experiencing it, kind of like the weather. But if you insert the active agent men, you have a new phrase, men's violence against women. It's more accurate, it's more honest, isn't it? But you rarely hear it, right? How are we going to get serious about dealing with human rights abuses and hate crimes and not talk honestly about the fact that the overwhelming number of them are committed by men? And then trying to figure out why that is and then what we can do about it. If we don't, we're just dancing around the problem and, and we're not getting to the heart of the matter. <laughs> and let me, let me say, thank you, let me say, it's not anti-male to say what I just said. I don't believe it for a nanosecond that anything that I just said is in any way anti-male. I don't buy that for a second. It's not anti-male to call it out. In fact, I think it's anti-male not to call it out. You know why? You know who the primary victims of most forms of violence are, with the exception of sexual violence? It's men and boys, that's who. When it comes to murder, attempted murder, assault, aggravated assault, gay bashing, bullying, the primary victims of all those crimes 
are men and boys. The primary perpetrators are also men and boys. So when we refuse to say that this is an issue of men's violence, it's not just men's violence against women, it's men's violence against other men and men's violence against themselves. My colleague Michael Kaufman wrote a paper in 1987, that's 31 years ago, shockingly, called The Triad of Men's Violence. And what he said is the triad of men's violence is men's violence against women, men's violence against other men, and men's violence against ourselves or themselves. They're all connected. And sophisticated people in the 21st century make those connections. The reason why I'm saying this is you'll hear people say things like, well, what about all the violence against men? We, we, we're focusing on women, but what about all the violence against men? As if feminists and activists haven't thought of that. It's like, oh, we hadn't really thought about violence against men. That's a good point. It's like, are you kidding me? We've think, been thinking about this for decades. And we've been making these connections for decades. Let me give you another example. When I say men's violence against themselves, you know what I'm talking about. Suicide, which is violence turned inward, right? Think about this. The United States of America, my country, 32,000 gun deaths per year. 32,000 gun deaths per year, which is pathetic and shameful. And I know that people around the world, including in Sweden, think that we're barbarians in the United States. And there's a lot of people in the United States who think we're barbarians. Two-thirds of the 32,000 gun deaths per year in the United States are suicides. Two-thirds. The vast majority of those suicide by gun are men killing themselves. And the fastest growing category of suicide by gun in the United States is white men over the age of 50. The same system, let me just say this, the same system that produces men who abuse women, in other words, that takes a 20-year-old college student and rapes, you know, a 20, the same system that produces a 20-year-old university man who rapes his fellow uh, student is the same system that produces a 47-year-old corporate executive in Stockholm who sexually harasses his subordinate or his colleague, is the same uh, system that produces adult men in Europe going to Southeast Asia or the United States going to South America to buy sex from 12-year-old kids is the same system that produces a 60-year-old man, white guy, in northern Sweden who goes out in the woods and shoots himself in the head. It's the same system that produces all those abuses. And it's the pathological way that we define manhood, that we train and socialize boys to deal with pain and sadness and disappointment and all the other emotions of life that so many men are ill-equipped to deal with. But they have the gun, they have the knife, they have the ability to use violence to sort of project and get angry at other people when in fact what they really need to do is get in touch with themselves. Don't you think? And all these things are linked. All these forms of violence are linked. And I say that because both on a practical level and on a, on a conceptual level, what the practical piece of it is, if you want to build support for the kind of work, the feminist work uh, in the battered women's movement, the sexual assault movements, and we need to build support, especially in this cultural moment, but we, one of the ways to build that support is to open up this discourse and widen it and talk about all the ways that domestic and sexual violence and men's violence against women are linked to other forms of violence, including men's violence against other men and against themselves. There's all these links and overlaps. I mean, how are we gonna talk about gang violence and not talk about sexual assault and domestic violence? I'm gonna to get to that in my talk. I've gone way off the menu of my prepared remarks. But I mean, really, they're all connected. And yet you have all these cities in, in Sweden, in the United States, and I work, you know, I work all, all over, but primarily in my country where you have all these people who are working, this, doing this great work on gang violence prevention on one side of the city and other people doing youth violence in the schools and in, in, the, in the community and you have people doing the domestic violence on this side and the, and the sexual assault people over here. They're all connected. All these issues are intersecting and connecting and sometimes people don't even know each other. It's incredible. I think we need to be smarter. You know, we need to not just work harder, we need to work smarter on these matters and connect all these overlapping and intersecting kinds of abuses and human rights abuses. Don't you think? Seems pretty basic to me. Oh, boy. <laughs> I want to show you a clip from one of my films because it brings it even more than me saying it from the stage, it brings it into full view the point that I'm making about the discourse and how the way that we talk about these issues has a lot to do with whether we are actually going to be effective in addressing these issues. So in my, in my film, Tough Guys, which is spelled G-U-I-S-E, tough guys, violence, manhood, and American culture. I have a section of the film that deals with 
the exclusion of um, explicit gendered discourse around masculinities when it comes to violence. And I would like to share that with you. I apologize. It's, I mean, it's American. I mean, I shouldn't say I apologize. It's American. Um, but I'm sure you have your Swedish analogs. And I, I've been saying this since I started coming to Sweden about 15 years ago. People in Sweden need to start making media literacy films more than they have already. Because we don't just have to bring it over from the States. You should produce it yourself. And, and you know, critiques of Swedish media discourse, not just the news, but the entertainment culture. And because media is so incredibly important in shaping people's understanding of the world. And, 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 and we need better media literacy education at all levels. And I'm just, that's just a plea for somebody to start. I know that some people are doing some good work, but it's not enough. I'm just going to say that. And I'm going to share with you my, my section from my film. Um, uh, Tough Guys 2, it's called uh, Hiding in Plain Sight. So Bjorn, if you could roll Hiding in Plain Sight, please. After every event like this, the questions always are the same. What causes this kind of a shooting? How can this happen? How can they be stopped? During hours and hours of exhaustive reporting, commentators seem to go out of their way to find gender-neutral ways to talk about this violence. The shooters in Aurora, the shooters in Newtown, the Connecticut shooter, the Aurora shooter, the alleged shooter, teenage psychopath, mass murderers, the suspect, that kid, this punk, this murderer. The male perpetrators become shooters, or murderers, or assailants, or killers, or suspects, or psychopaths. It's kids killing kids in the heart of America. Violence committed by boys becomes kids killing kids and youth violence. Here is a revealing and frankly horrifying picture of youth violence in America. It doesn't seem to matter that girls are kids and youths too, but only commit a fraction of these kinds of crimes. And this baseline failure to acknowledge gender has a big effect when the discussion turns to other supposed causes of violence. Violence in the entertainment culture. Bloody games, gory movies, brutal TV shows. Call of Duty or Halo. Mental health issues, the faith issues. Autism or Asperger's syndrome. You're blaming the gun. Their mom and their dad. Substance abuse. Mental health, violent games, violent movies. I want to blame Alex. the real culprit. Alex. Suicide pills. Alex. Mass murder pills. We hear very little, if anything, about why it is that girls and women also live in a culture saturated with guns and media violence, also suffer from mental illness, also come from dysfunctional families and have substance abuse problems, yet don't commit anywhere near the amount of violence boys and men do. In other cases, the perpetrators disappear altogether. Violence against women. Violence against women. Violence against women. You see this a lot in the mainstream discussion about so-called violence against women. The fact that men are responsible for somewhere around 98% of this violence simply evaporates. We hear about women being harassed, abused, assaulted, or raped. Men are nowhere to be found. And the result of all this is that instead of seeing men's violence against women as a men's issue, we see it as a women's issue and focus most of our attention on how to help victims and survivors after the fact. A failure all the more glaring given that mainstream media outlets have no problem at all taking gender seriously when women are the ones doing the violence. Teenage girls involved in violent fights. A fight between two young girls breaks out on the playground. More and more teenage girls are getting involved in violent fights. When girls and women act out violently, their gender becomes the story. The same way race becomes the story with men of color. The horrific murder rate in Chicago. <laughs> Does it have to do with guns or race? When men of color rape women or shoot people or blow things up, race and culture move to the forefront of the story, crowding out the fact that the vast majority of the perpetrators under consideration, no matter what color they are, are men. All of this is partly a function of how dominant ideologies work linguistically to conceal the power of dominant groups. For example, when we hear the word race in the United States, we tend immediately to think about African Americans, Latinos, Asian Americans, Native Americans, Pacific Islanders, South Asians. When we hear the term sexual orientation, we tend to think of gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgendered people. And when we hear the term gender, we tend to think of women. In each case, the dominant group, white people, heterosexual people, men, don't get examined. As if white people don't belong to some racial grouping, as if heterosexual people don't have some sort of sexual orientation, as if men don't have a gender. In other words, we always focus on the subordinated group and not on the dominant one. And that's one of the ways that the power of dominant groups isn't questioned, by remaining invisible. There are young men involved in these things. There's a lot of testosterone there. And on those rare occasions when the subject of men does make its way into mainstream discussions about violence, there's this common refrain that men's violence is all about testosterone and our prehistoric role as hunter-warriors were just programmed to be violent. What is it about the testosterone of being a young man that makes this come to this gun violence head so often? Why does it seem that these mass shooters are boys? 
and not girls. Really, it goes back to hunter-gatherer days. Yeah. You hear another version of this in the common refrain, boys will be boys. Let boys be boys. They want to play rough. Don't try and over-medicate them and, you know, turn them into girls. They're boys. A six-year-old boy goes like this, and he's suspended. And, and, and we end up having to talk about it because, you know, they just are unable to let boys be boys. No one would deny that there are biological factors that sometimes come into play with violence. The problem is when biological arguments lead people to conclude that men are just beasts who are overcome by hormonal urges they can't control, that men are incapable of making moral and ethical decisions, that boys are born hardwired to bully, rape, and murder. But perhaps the most damaging thing this kind of thinking does is that it blinds us to the fundamental role that cultural systems play in all of this. Can I add about the boys will be boys concept? That it's often said in defense of bad behavior by boys or men. What do you expect? You know, he's a guy, he's a boy. Boys will be boys, right? And you have your own saying in, in Swedish, right? I heard it last night, but I can't remember. What is, what is the saying in Swedish that's the same as boys will, similar to boys will be boys? What? What? Boyga? Poiga? Ah? Poiga. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, anyhow, um, it's usually said in defense of bad behavior by boys and men, but it's an actu actually an anti male statement to make because the implication is that boys and men are not ethical beings who can make choices, ethical choices about their behavior, that somehow, you know, this hormonal urges are just, you know, overcoming our ability to make moral and ethical decisions. That's an anti male statement. And by the way, one of the ironies of, of feminists being called anti-male is that feminists actually have more respect for men than that. Feminists hold men to a higher standard than that. They know that we're capable of better than that. But they get called anti-male, and the people who defend bad behavior because boys will be boys are supposedly pro-male? This is topsy-turvy land. This is upside-down world. You following me on this? By the way, boys can rise to our expectations or they can sink to our expectations. Men can rise to our expectations or sink to them. We need to raise our expectations, not sink to them. Don't you think? Am I like the most American person in this room? No? I'm not saying the only American. I said the most American. No? Okay. So I have some company. Because I know my style is a little more... American than is normative at the Swedish Human Rights Forum. But we, don't we need to be outraged about human rights abuses? Don't we need to be outraged about all the violence and abuse that men are inflicting on women and children and themselves? Isn't this outrageous? And we haven't even gotten to white nationalism and the Sweden Democrats and Jordan Peterson. We haven't even gotten there yet. I'm saving up a little outrage for the end of my talk. <laughs> well, actually, you know what? I want to say something about the battered women's movement and the sexual assault movement. And I said earlier, men, men for gender equality, I work with Unison as well. There's people from Unison here, great organization that takes you know, care of the victims and survivors and the, and, the, and the back end of when we're not taking care of the front end of dealing with socializing boys and men better, the back end is all the pain and suffering that the people at Unison and, and, the, and the battered women's programs and sexual assault programs deal with every single day. And by the way, victims are both women and men, right? Girls and boys. Anyhow, People like Jordan Peterson are constantly trashing feminists. And he was just here, what, last week? In a big arena. I'm sure I wasn't there, but I'm sure he was trashing feminists because that's part of his uh, stock in trade, right? And so I'm going to say something about feminists and the battered women's movement and the sexual assault movements. Women have been incredible, both here in Sweden and all over the world, over the past, you know, 200 plus years, but also more specifically over the past 50 years in building the battered women's and sexual assault movements. Men had been 
beating women in relationships and families and marriages for thousands of years, for thousands of years. These aren't recent problems in our species, but it wasn't until the 1970s that there was such a thing as a battered women's program, right? A battered women, a shelters, uh, uh, vic services for victims and survivors, and, and toll-free numbers for victims to call, and trained counselors in universities and high schools and in, in communities to deal with all the needs of the victims and survivors. It was, there was very little offender accountability on domestic violence until the 1970s, until, by the way, women got together, all over Sweden, but all over Europe, all over the world, certainly in my country, got together. There were some men who supported them, there's no doubt. There was men who were supportive of those women. Not enough, but there were men. But in a multiracial, multi-ethnic sense, women came together and said, we need services, we need funding for these programs, we need to take care of these people, we need to, we need to hold offenders accountable, we need to do prevention programs, all that kind of stuff that we take for granted, many of us in the wealthy world, and by the way, we shouldn't take it for granted, and parts of our own wealthy world, if you will, including in Europe, there's countries in Europe have pathetically low levels of support for victims and survivors of sexual and domestic violence, including countries that have all kinds of money. It's not about money in the case of what I'm talking about. There's wealthy countries in Europe that have a pathetic level of lack of support for victims and survivors of sexual and domestic violence. But anyways, all the stuff that we have that we take for granted today, even though it's not perfect, is because of women's leadership with some men supporting them. In the sexual assault field, same thing. Men have been sexually assaulting women and children and other men for thousands of years, not a recent problem, thousands of years. And it goes on to this very moment. And, and it's ritualized and supported in all kinds of cultural practices all over the world, men's sexual violence against women, children, and other men. But there wasn't any such thing as a rape crisis center until the 1970s. There weren't trained counselors on university campuses and in communities to deal with and advocate for the needs of victims and survivors. There was very little accountability for offenders. I mean, and again, to the extent that there's prevention programming today, it's there because of women's leadership with some men supporting them. And it's been incredible what these women have been able to accomplish. But what, there's been so many misconceptions about these accomplishments. And you know, one of them is, um, you know, Jordan Peterson furthers this, is just that feminists, you know, you know, have some categorical dismissal of men or hate men or some ignorant stuff like that gets, that gets passed off as common sense in these corridors of, uh, uh, of ignorance. Um, so I, I just want to clear up a couple of misconceptions about women's advocacy and leadership in the sexual assault and domestic violence field. This doesn't completely correct the record, but it gives you at least some way to respond, okay? So let me think, let's think about this. Um, many people think that women and girls have benefited from women's advocacy in these movements, and they have. But it's not just women. Some people think that men have actually been pushed backwards by women's progress. That, in a nutshell, is the men's rights, so-called men's rights argument that as women have progressed, men have somehow been pushed backwards, that it's a zero-sum game, and as women progress, men get pushed back. Um, and the, the uh, current occupant of the White House made a statement to that effect just a couple of weeks ago, how it's a real hard time to be a man, and men are the real victims in a sense. So this kind of ignorance has a megaphone, a huge platform in the cultural moment that we live in, that somehow men have been disadvantaged by forward progress on women. I don't think that most people think that, but the people who advocate that do have a big megaphone, microphone world stage. But I think what most people think is that men and boys are just kind of floating out there. We're just kind of, we, need, we have a lot of needs that aren't being met and, uh, and we need a lot more help and support which I agree with and everybody that I know agrees with and has always agreed with. You won't find in my circles of feminists and pro-feminist men and activists and intellectuals and everything else, anybody who's gonna say, oh yeah, men are all doing real well. We all think that we need a whole lot more support for boys and men and attention to the needs of boys and men. But the idea that somehow boys and men are just kind of floating out there and haven't been affected by the domestic and sexual violence movements is such ignorance. And I'll just give you two examples of how profoundly men have been influenced in a positive way by this work. The first example has to do with uh, domestic violence and its effects on children. So in the field, we've been talking increasingly over the past 20 years about all the 
children growing up in homes where their father abuses their mother, their mother's boyfriend abuses their mother. Sometimes the mother is the abuser, and this is also true in gay male relationships and lesbian relationships and other social arrangements. Sadly, there's an awful lot of kids, even as we speak, in Sweden and all over the world, and certainly in the U.S., who are growing up in homes where they're being exposed to quote-unquote domestic violence. And there's a term that people have used to refer to these kids. It's called children who witness domestic violence. Do you, do you hear that term? And uh, sometimes people shorthand that to say children who witness. Well, this is a term that I don't like and I don't use. You know why? Because if you're a seven-year-old kid cowering in the closet as your father or another man is raging against your mother, you're not a witness. You're a victim. You're not observing something happening to somebody else. You're experiencing it happening to yourself. The experience of trauma is much more immediate and profound than is suggested by the passive word witness. Well, guess what? The category of children who are being traumatized in this way includes not just girls, but also boys. Do you have any idea how many boys in Sweden right now as we speak are either in the juvenile system you know, the juvenile system because of committing antisocial behavior or in other ways acting out because they've been traumatized in their families, in their, in their childhoods, in their early adolescence, and they don't know how to take a path different from the traditional path that we give to boys who have been traumatized, which is somebody took something from me, I'm going to take it from somebody else, which is why boys who have been abused are something like 10 times more likely to become abusive of others than boys who have not been abused. The prison system in Sweden and the prison system in the United States, in every state, is filled with chronologically adult men who, underneath the tatted up bodies and the bad asthma attitude, are little boys, emotionally and developmentally, many of whom armored up as little boys against violence done towards them. And in some cases, they committed antisocial behavior against others. And I'm not defending the bad behavior by trying to explain it. And I'm saying this, and I say this in the States emphatically all the time. We homo sapiens have a big enough brain that we can hold more than one thought in our head at the same time, which is to say we can hold individuals accountable for their behavior and we can take a step back and ask how our institutional practices and the way we socialize boys and define manhood and all that, how are those producing predictable outcomes? We can do that at the same time as we hold individuals accountable for their behavior. It's not one or the other. And the reason why I'm saying that is because on the right, you have people who say, the moment you start trying to explain what's going on with a sophisticated sort of sociological examination, you get accused of making excuses for bad behavior, which is what we're not doing. We're trying to understand it so we can do differently because we, we can see so clearly how predictable these patterns are. And we're trying to figure out how to do it better, don't you think? And yet the women, by the way, in the battered women's movement, get accused of being anti-male. They're bashing men. Meanwhile, those women have had the guts to speak truth to power for the last 50 years. They're the ones who have called out adult men's violence that in defense of boys, not just in defense of girls. When are you going to hear that? You're going to hear that from Jordan Peterson's mouth on a stage full of thousands of young white men who are angry at feminists? Are you going to hear Jordan Peterson say that feminists are the first ones to speak up in your defense? While the, while the men who were supposedly on your side were silent? Are you kidding me? You'll never hear that, will you? You'll never hear that at a Sweden Democrats rally, will you? Meanwhile, it's filled with young, angry boys, angry at their fathers who are taking it out on dark-skinned immigrants. Sorry, I'm going off on this. Let's talk about sexual assault. And you know what angle about sexual assault? Men's victimization of sexual abuse and, and violence. Because you know that there's an awful lot of men and boys who have been sexually assaulted and abused. Most of the time by men, sometimes by women. We're talking about this in a way that we've never talked about. It's been going on for thousands of years in, in human culture men's sexual abuse of boys and other men. We're talking about it now in a way that's transformative in historical terms. Why are we talking about it now? And who were the first people to talk about boys and men as the victims of sexual violence? You know who it was? Feminist women in the 1970s, that's who it was. They're the first people to talk about men and boys as the victims of sexual violence and sexual abuse. But when's the last time you heard feminist women credited with opening up cultural space 
for talking about boys and men's experience of sexual victimization and trying to get the conversation going so we can have the, the, the services and the treatment for boys and men who have been the victims of sexual violence, who deserve as much treatment as girls and women do. When have you heard feminist women credited with creating that conversation and opening up that space? You're much more likely to hear they just hate men, they just bash in men, right? I hope if you learn or hear or remember nothing else from the, my talk this morning, you remember that next time you hear somebody calling out battered women's movement and the sexual assault movement as anti-male, you remember some of the things that I've said, because I don't believe this. I don't believe that they're anti-male for one millisecond. In fact, I believe that what they've been doing is the best thing that could ever happen to men and young men and boys. And by the way, not all the victims, if you will, or survivors that are men of these kinds of crimes end up in the prison system. They're also walking wounded on the streets of Stockholm and Lulia and Malmo and every other city and every other town in Sweden. They're walking wounded adult men who are trying to build relationships with human beings and have difficulty with relationships, have depression, have emotional problems, have alcohol and drug problems, have food addictions, right? Because they're self-medicating against the effects of all the trauma and all the abuse, but they don't have the cultural permission to, to get help and to acknowledge their vulnerability, right? And many of those men are attracted to the kind of political movements and social thinkers who talk about manning up, just man up. You got a problem, suck it up. It's a short step from suck it up to, isn't it? Which brings me to the last portion of my prepared remarks, <laughs> such as they are. <laughs> oh boy. We can't talk about white nationalism and the rise of authoritarian movements here in Europe and in the United States and elsewhere as just racist movements because they're not just racist movements. They are racist, but they're not just racist. White nationalism is not just about defending white Europe or defending white America. It's about defending a certain kind of white masculinity. How many indications do we need of this? How many manifestos by crazy maniacs like Anders Breivik in Norway do we need to read to know that they know what they're talking about, these, these white nationalists, that it's not just about whiteness, it's about masculinity. It's about their understanding of defending a traditional white heterosexual masculinity against feminist cha ch challenges to white male centrality, against LGBT challenges to heterosexual centrality. Gender and sexuality is at the heart of the white nationalist movement in the United States and in Europe, and it has to be talked about out loud. You can't address a problem if you're not willing to talk about it out loud. About a year and a half ago, or I don't know exactly when it was, there was a, maybe it was a year and plus ago, there was a, a big uh, rally in Poland, Polish Independence Day, right? And at the time, it was, and it was, it was, it was made international news because there was all these white, and I'll say people for the moment, white people at this rally, um, Sig Heiling, and, 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 and with, with like German slogans from the Nazi era in a country that was decimated by the Nazis. It was crazy, but it was this white nationalist rally and it was the biggest uh, far right rally in Europe, or I think in Europe, but certainly in Poland since the Second World War era. And all the international news talked about this sort of white fear of racial and ethnic integration. And almost nobody mentioned that the political program that was being represented by that, that rally in, in Polish Independence Day was all about not just white homogeneity and trying to maintain this fictional culture of white homogeneity, but it was also explicitly anti-feminist and explicitly anti-gay. And yet that gets completely marginalized in the discourse. It's central. It's got to be talked about. It's got to be talked about, and it's not going to go away unless we talk about it. And let me just say, in, unless we figure out a way to talk to young white men in a way that they feel included in that conversation, the Jordan Petersons of the world that continue to fill stadiums, and the Sweden Democrats are going to continue to build support among white men, and alternatives for Deutschland are going to continue to get white guys, angry white guys, joining them until we figure out a way to talk to white men, especially young white men, and bring them into the conversation about how they can be part of the dynamic changes in the societies that they're living in, they're gonna be attracted to demagogues who tell them that <sighs> the, 
that the other side, which is the progressive side, the feminist side, has contempt for them. Because if you listen to Jordan Peterson, you know what he says over and over again, is he says to white young men, you matter, you matter. Feminists might want to discard you. People of color in this sort of ethnic and racial and multiracial movements might want to push you aside. But I respect you, and you and your people built this culture. They, you built Western civilization, and I respect you. And they hear that from the Sweden Democrats and the Alternatives for Deutschland and Donald Trump. But what they hear from the left and from, from progressives and feminists is a lot of like, white men got to get off stage. It's time for us. It's time for women. It's time for people of color. It's time for us to shine. And I appreciate that, and I'm, I agree on one level, but we have to have a narrative that also figures out a way to include white men as part of the dynamic change in our society, or we're, gonna, we're, gonna, or we're losing. We're losing. And I say this as an American who's horrified, like millions of my country people, that Donald J. Trump is the president of the United States, and he's a product of a lot of the systems that I've been talking about. You follow me on this? So this is real. This isn't just some you know, ideological wish list or something. It's just like, this is what's really happening on the ground. I'm going to close, because I'm about to get the big hook by Klaus, which I appreciate, but I'm going to close by saying this. One of the ways that we're going to bring more men into this conversation, and white men as well as men of color, is to talk about strength in a different way. When I say that, I mean what I mean by that. What, what, here's what I mean by that. You'll hear on the other side people saying that people like me and women doing this kind of work as well will always uh, don't want men to be strong. We want to make men soft, right? And let me just say, I don't want to make men soft. I want to make men strong. I think I'm strong and I'm a man. I have a 17-year-old son and my wife and myself, we want to our son to be a strong man. The question is not whether we want men to be strong. The question is how do you define strength? That's the key question. S strength, true strength, is not just your ability to impose your will on another through your force or through your power. True strength is moral courage, it's social courage, it's speaking up to bullies, it's saying even when your voice is cracking to your friend, hey man, you know, you're my friend, but you just, you just, the way you're talking about women is not cool. That takes strength. That takes guts. We need to say this. We need to say that if you're a guy, being one of the guys takes nothing special. It takes nothing special to be one of the guys if you're a guy. What takes something special is a guy who turns to his friends and says, dudes, the way you're acting is not cool. I'm not cool with that. That takes so much more guts. And yet the one who does it, it gets called soft. This is, again, topsy-turvy land. By the way, same with racism. The white person who challenges other white people on their racism is not soft or politically correct, it's a person of integrity who has the guts to speak up and say, this is not cool. You're against the values of the society that you say to, you say to, um, uh, to uphold. And I need to uphold the rules of the speaker who has to finish and cede the ground to the panel. So let me just say, we need to talk about strength in more positive ways and more expansive ways. And the last thing is we need to talk about leadership because we need more leaders in our societies who are willing to say some of these things. You don't have to have a title of leader next to your name to be a leader. You, if, you, if you're a 14-year-old boy and you see your friend mistreating his girlfriend and you say, man, you know, this is not cool. You gotta, you gotta get some help, but this is not okay. That's an act of leadership. He doesn't have to have a title next to his name. But those of us who are in positions of formal leadership need to be held to account on a much higher level. We need more men in rooms like this. We need more adult, powerful men in Sweden coming to human rights conferences. We need more men who are in business, in politics, in sports culture, in media, in education. We need superintendents of school districts, not just teachers. And I need to get off the stage. Thank you. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you. Thank should you, I, Jackson. Should I stay up here? Why don't you come over here with me, and we'll have a short conversation as uh, our volunteers will be making a ready the stage for the panel. Why don't we give an applause to the volunteers who are making this possible? <laughs> and also, why not thank the translators that are doing an immense job? And please, Jackson, 
come come and join me for okay. a while here. We, we'll be waiting for some chairs and from okay. some tables and for the other panelists so as well. Um, um, I'll introduce myself in a moment, but I will be the moderator of the panel in a moment. Uh, Jackson, thank you so much for your leadership uh, and all the work that you have done for many, many, many years now. You are a true leader in the field. Uh, and, and actually, and also thank you for your passion. Thank you so much for your passion. Um. Thank you. Thank you. What started you off? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good, I mean, that's an important question, but it's, it's a long, I, 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 I know I can't give you a long answer. No. Um, um, I, as a young university student, I mean, back in the late uh, Mesozoic era, when I was a young guy, and uh, I just, uh, when I started, when I, for example, a big moment in my university career, or in my life, really, was when I was, uh, I was a young journalist for my student newspaper, and, uh, and uh, I was covering a rally where a group of women students were organizing for better lighting on campus because there had been a couple of rapes that happened outside. Most rapes happen inside, and most of the perpetrators know the victims, and victims know the perpetrators. But in this case, it was strangers in a, in a, in a uh, uh, parking lot, car park. Anyhow, um, I saw these women, they were organizing for better lighting, and I remember thinking, not that these women hated men, but that these women were standing up for themselves. It was like they were, we have the right to walk across campus and not worry about being raped or sexually assaulted. I remember thinking if I were a woman and I had to worry about this all the time, I'd be so pissed off. And instead of being defensive in the face of women's righteous anger, I was more inspired by it. Like, wow, that's, that's what leadership looks like. That's what standing up for yourself looks like. Yeah. And that's, that was the beginning of it. And then I realized as a man, as a white man, heterosexual, you know, I was in a position to, to, to make a difference. And I also remember thinking, where are the men? Why aren't there men out there? Yeah. It was all women. It's like men are the ones doing the most of the violence. Why aren't there more men? Because most men aren't violent. And I just thought, I got to start speaking out. That's how Great. it happened. Great. Thank yeah. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So uh, let's move over to the chairs. And let me invite the other panelists up on the stage as well. So um, please. Come forward. It's time to sit. <laughs> sit and talk. <laughs> so uh, as the panelists arrive, uh, I'll just say their names. Rebecca Andersson from uh, Unison. <laughs> and uh, Alan Ali from uh, the organization MEN. <laughs> and uh, Ulf Stenberg, you have already met, uh, um, from Frisuset. And of course, Jackson, you've met for quite a while now. <laughs> um, uh, my name is Klaus Hylander. I work for Sveriges Kommuner och Landsting uh, with something we call uh, SKL's Kvinnofridsatsning, um, an effort to work uh, against men's violence against women, uh, and basically to, to, um, to better the circumstances for our members, uh, local authorities, kommuner, uh, and uh, regions, landsting, regioner, to identify and to provide protection uh, to victims of violence and also to prevent violence, for instance, in schools. Um, and I'm honored to be here today with this prominent panel. Um, I'm very excited to, to have this panel conversation. So um, for the, those of you that are new here in this, on the stage, would you just like to say uh, your name again and a little bit about your organization? Uh, where do you come from? What do you do? Uh, my name is Ulf Stenberg, and I'm uh, artistic director of uh, Theater Fryshuset. We do theater about uh, current social issues and destructive behavior. Great, thank you. My name is Alain Ali, and I am uh, chair of the uh, organization MEN for gender equality. MEN was founded in 1993 uh, as a platform for men to work against uh, violence, men's violence against women. And uh, today we have over 1,500 members and have only about 20 sections throughout Sweden. And uh, we work to engage men in fighting men's violence and to create a world without violence. Great, thank you. 
Hello everyone, uh, my name is Rebecca Andersson. I work at Unison. Uh, we are an umbrella organization gathering more than 130 women's shelters, young women empowerment centers, youth empowerment centers, and support services like rape crisis centers. Um, we uh, are spread all over Sweden, um, and I work as an organizational developer for violence prevention there. Great, and uh, let me just uh, follow in the footsteps of Jackson and thank your organization for the leadership that you're providing in this field. Thank you so much. And Jackson, would you like to say something about your background that we don't know? <laughs> um, Are I you with an organization I'm from, I'm from, today? I'm from uh, Boston, but I lived in California for almost 20 years. But I spent a lot of time traveling throughout the United States in conservative areas and Midwest and Texas and the South. So even though I've been living on both coasts, I have a lot of, you know, sort of broader palette of experience and, and travel. And I'm really happy to be with these great folks. Great. Thank you so much. So, so uh, and also thank you, uh, uh, those of you that are not uh, American or uh, <laughs> English uh, mother tongue speakers, thank you for doing this in our <laughs> second language. So, uh, great. Uh, I'd like to start, Ulf, uh, with you since you um, set the scene with uh, this monologue from the Top Boy. Um, uh, can, uh, as I understand, it's the first time I see it. It's a, it, it's, it's a story about football hooliganism. And um, uh, certainly, th that's one of those phrases where we don't really um, explicitly mention men. Uh, but it's so obvious that it's about men, right? Yeah. Uh, can you just say something about, uh, about Top Boy and um, um, what's, the, what's about for you? Yeah, well... Top Boy and that kind of uh, environment is, is it's an extremely male environment and uh, I think it's about searching for a male identity and, and you end up in this kind of, of uh, organizations or lifestyles because there is such easy rules to follow. It's very clear rules. There are no... Uh, gray areas it's 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 right or wrong and it's good or bad and it's very obvious what the rules the male rules to follow are and the consequences are also very <laughs> clear so for, for for young young man to to live in that kind of environment it's 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 quite easy because the the it's so clear mm -hmm. Great. And, and Top Boy, you've been doing it since when? Uh, too long. Uh, we've been doing it since 2007. Uh, I think we've done about almost 400 shows. Uh, I've been trying to end it for quite a few years, but we still do it uh, occasionally. And it's because it's, it's still a, a current issue. It's something that we still haven't found a solution to. So that's why we people still want, want us to come and, and, and play it. Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, Rebecca, I was, I was thinking, um, I mean, the topic here is that violence is a man's issue. Uh, and it's based on this very basic observation, really, that the majority of all violence is committed by men. So why is it then, do you think, that uh, violence so often is described in gender-neutral terms? I mean, we use words like street violence or domestic violence or family violence. Why, why is it, really? It's a good question. <laughs> and we uh, struggle with it, I would say, in the women's movement, of course. Sometimes it's astonishing to see that we still have to uh, name perpetrators and uh, effect effectively saying what's actually happening. It's not the apartment that's had a fight, it's a man who's been perpetrating violence against a woman. If, for example, uh, I think the reasons for it is that we are afraid and that it's convenient and comfortable. I mean, convenience and comfort are our biggest challenges, I would say. Change is never going to be comfortable. Um, um, but if we want change, we have to step up and, and be uncomfortable. And uh, the afraid, I think we are um, 
afraid to challenge male power. It's a power issue. Um, we are afraid to name the perpetrator. And for women, of course, it's dangerous, of course, to challenge male power and, and, and name male perpetrators. Um, and violence is very frightening. This is not any issue as any other. It's very frightening, and the consequences can be big. But if, I, I just feel like um, sometimes we, when we are struggling alone to naming uh, gender and the perpetrator, we feel, as I assume you would feel when someone's a climate change denier or something like that, it feels like you're alone screaming in a room and no one's hearing you. So we need more people to, to challenge that fright and, and comfort. Yeah, so it's like almost your, your, I think when we speak of being afraid or that we uh, feel there's a risk, actually maybe that's a way of saying or detecting that we're in a power field. Yeah. So, so really yeah. what you're saying is that if we, if we uh, uh, mention gender and yeah. masculinity and men, it challenges the power of system. Course. Yes, and of course, we in the women's movement, it's, it's kind of plain and simple to the fact that being afraid to change, compare that to being afraid of being a victim of violence. It's like, I know what I would choose. I would rather change and change the society and change myself than be afraid of violence all the time. Okay, great. Uh, Alan, would you like to add something to there? Why do we, why do we, use, uh, well, why do we use gender neutral language all the time when it when we speak about violence. I think Rebecca covered it very well, but at the same time, I think it's also about the norms. We like just compared with sports. We, we talk about soccer and then we talk about the women's league of soccer, you know, or we talk about uh, violence and then we talk about race and violence. Uh, then it's, you know, it's, it's accurate to talk about like, oh, they are like Muslims or they are because of their culture and so on. But if it, when it's white men, like if it's a part of the norm, then we, not, we don't tend to call it like it's men's violence because it's, it's just violence. So I think we need to like, you know, to, to put it, uh, to highlight it, this is about the norm. Men are the norm in society and then also the norm has to change. Yeah, okay. So, 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 could one say that uh, the gender neutral language used, in, in a way, it kind of sustains the power system? Would, would you say that, Jackson? It sustains it? Absolutely does. And that's why, uh, again, at a human rights conference, I'm glad we're talking about this at the beginning of the conference, because so much human rights uh, discourse is gender neutral. And, and, you know, I've worked with the UN for a number of years, and I've talked to many feminists who work at the UN, and their UN organizations, so many of the body, both, both the body of the most powerful bodies at the UN, and also, you know, all kinds of other subordinate bodies at the UN, there's this, like, this talking around the problem. There's just all this gender-neutral language. Meanwhile, the whole thing is about gender. Not the whole thing, but it's a central piece of it. So, yeah, and I think Rebecca's answer was, was perfectly uh, on point. It's, it's fear. And I, I think one of the roles that men can play, if I might, I think men can say some of the things that women either can't say or take more risks when women say them. So I think we, we need more men who are willing to say some of these things. And that when men say some of these things, yes, we're going to get criticized. I get, uh, I get lots of anger directed at me as well. But I think we should be doing this. More men should be doing this so that we can take some of the pressure off the women because we, we're, we're in a position to do that, don't you think? And powerful men, not just... 16-year-old boys, powerful men need to be saying some of this stuff out loud and not just at human rights conferences, don't you think? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's right. so, so, so obviously there are, um, many of us know that there are negative reactions when you actually uh, speak in gender non-neutral ways, when we speak about men and the role of men in masculinity. Um, I'm just curious, uh, Ulf, when, when you um, put on Top Boy, uh, do you get negative reactions as well uh, concerning um, challenging masculinity and men? Well, yes, yeah, sometimes. Uh, but um, it's quite interesting to see that, uh, I mean, we play this this show so many times and we played it for uh, football hooligans uh, a number of times, many times, and, and even for audiences only, uh, with only football hooligans in the, in the audience, and we have a, a, a talk with them afterwards, and, and I'm, I'm surprised that they're not, not that um, uh, 
provoked by by the idea of, of why we why we do it. But the thing is that I agree with, with what you're saying. Uh, but the thing is that we. Uh, a lot of the times we preach for people who are already in the game, who already agree with us, and that's a problem because for me as a, as a soon 40-year-old uh, cultural working actor from the middle class to say I stand for this and I believe in this and this, it doesn't cost me anything. It doesn't cost me anything. But if, you know, where, where I grew up in, in Umeå working at... Uh, the Volvo factory uh, in that, you know, coffee room, if somebody there would speak up these kind of things, that would cost something for that person because that would mean they, they risk exclusion and they, they s that's something completely different and that's what we have to, to aim for. It is, as, as you say, that we speak uh, about this at, at a conference like this, uh, you know, it's not that I'm saying that we shouldn't do it. Of course we should, but it doesn't cost any of us anything. No, uh, okay. So we have to find other ways and other arenas to, and other people who are willing to kind of uh, start to, to, to have those kind of conversations and thoughts. Yeah, yeah okay. So again, it's like um, uh, what I hear you saying is that risking exclusion is then uh, part of, again, the power system working. Uh, so, so this is, I, I think we've identified uh, like a central part of the work that we have to do, uh, finding ways to overcome those um, risks and those fears and um, the costs. Uh, I know, uh, Alan, I mean, uh, your organization is uh, arranging a lot of um, talks with, with men all over Sweden after Me Too. Exactly. Uh, what, what's the... What's the um, what reactions do you get in those contexts? Yeah, well, we're touring around Sweden. We're, our goal is to visit 20 cities and to engage 1,500 men in, in talks about, like, post Me Too talks. And uh, often when the men come to our gatherings, often they are like, uh, they think that we're going to give a lecture about Me Too. But uh, on the contrary, we're going to talk about them individually. So we sit in uh, small groups and talk about our own relation to the, the Me Too, you know, what happened during Me Too, the stories, and everybody are, you know, they are entitled to their own um, thoughts, their own, uh, you know, views, and they can speak for three minutes without interruption, etc. And uh, nobody is, uh, have, like, uh, have, uh, nobody can during this time to uh, question them or g give them further questions. And so, and this, so it's, an, it's a play of like, you need to learn to listen and not to interrupt, and then you get your own time to talk about this. So we, and the, our reactions are like, they are very, um, often they, they get very surprised by it. Like, oh, I'm not, you're not gonna talk about me too, about the other ones? Do I have to talk about myself? And then they get even more surprised when they start to talk about their own experience related to me too, in, whatever way it is and they, they get very surprised by how good it feels and how like it's like to talk about it and we also struggle with this issue like whom are we targeting who, who are coming to our uh, sessions and we try to you know to get uh, get a broader audience and to, to start to you know encourage men you know to talk to their friends and some of the of our participants they take uh, they want to take this method that we are using it's called the small room to take it to their companies and to talk, use the method within like in the coffee room in other places. So we are slowly getting there, but it's a very big challenge. Mm. And just last thing, we are, our participants have been from like 20 years old to up to like 75, and all have similar reactions, very positive about okay, the great. So. So I, I, think you're, is, I think you're showing us an example of, of creating safe spaces but we have to find ways of creating those safe spaces also in the context where there are costs and risks, right? Uh, um, Rebecca, um, uh, something that we often hear in this discussion about the role of men and men's responsibilities is that uh, it seems like men that themselves don't perpetrate violence, uh, by their own definition at least, um, seem to feel really accused, you know, and, and uh, kind of, uh, they almost uh, become the victims themselves of this discussion. 
Um, wh what can we say, do you think, and this I, I think we'll need a panel to help because it's pretty complex. Um, what, what can we say to those men? We're asking them to join a, mov a movement, to join uh, the efforts to change. And they, they themselves are saying, but why am I responsible for what this guy over there is doing? I'm, I don't know him. I'm not part of his life. He's the perpetrator. I'm not. What, what do you, how can we mobilize men? Oh, yeah. How can we mobilize men? That's quite <laughs> this million-dollar question. I, I'm just going to um, reflect on what we hear and what men, if anyone questions us. Uh, uh, first, I'm going to say that men who are uh, promoting a change and who are working for gender equality and who are somewhat interested in this, they are not feeling accused from our perspective. They are kind of relieved. And I would say, especially after Me Too, they are kind of relieved that we finally get to talk about this amongst men as well. So I'm, I'm going to say that like the accused men are not the majority of men. However, the accused men are very loud and they have a big platform, uh, especially on social media. So uh, I think the key here is to understand that violence is very complex, but it's also an individual and a collective issue at the same time. So the individual is always responsible for the violence. However, we are collectively responsible for the environment, the norms the, the, that we create together. Therefore, the responsibility is collective for us to change it. But the individual, of course, is, uh, respect, or is responsible for their own actions. Uh, I think also we need to uh, uh, keep this um, work going forward both at the same time individually and collectively and individually for example we need to uh, hold individuals responsible i think men as well want individuals who individual men who perpetrate violence to uh, see we, we need to have effects or consequences for that for example uh, in Sweden, we have great laws for rape, for example, but n hardly anyone is convicted of rape. So it's, I, I, I would understand for men as well, no one is convicted, so we're kind of blaming everyone. We're blaming the woman. We're kind of blaming men as a group. The individual needs consequences for us to have the strength and uh, ability to do the collective change, I would say. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Uh, I would like to ask Jackson, would you like to add something to that question? You know, I, how do we deal with this feeling with, with uh, at, at least, I, I would say it's, I mean, I see two reactions from men that are not involved in this work. Either it's silence and pass passiveness, uh, or it's, uh, you know, uh, a negative, uh, overt reaction, kind of stopping the conversation. How, what would you say? How do we deal with that? Well, it's a great an important question. I mean, the first thing I, was you, when you were asking the question, Klaus, what, I, what occurred to me was this is an old question. It goes back at least as, as long as the, uh, the Bible. Am I my brother's keeper? Am I my sister's keeper? So is, this is not a new question about, you know, men in the current moment, do we speak up and do we feel blamed or do we take responsibility? These are big questions in the human project and have been for a long time. Um, I mean, this is, this is, the, this is a, a question that I deal with all the time. I mean, and, and then the work that I do, in the, whether it's in the sports culture, in the military, in schools, in all kinds of other s settings, it's like, what, is our, what are our responsibilities to each other I, I, as friends, as, as family members, as community members, as members of the, you know, the, the Swedish National Project? What's, what are our responsibilities to each other? And, and, and part of what we're fighting against, in, even more so in the United States, but, but also in Sweden, is this sort of individualism. You know, individualism. It's like, I'm going to take care of business. If I don't abuse women, it's not my problem. But in a sense, that's not, that's not true. It is your problem. And, we, and you have collective sort of consequences. So if the consequences are collective, which they clearly are, then the responsibility should be also collective, don't you think? And I think framing it in a positive, aspirational way, and I appreciate Ulf's comments, and I appreciated Ulf's performance too, by the way. It was, that was fantastic. And I wish I had been in the room with a bunch of hooligans watching that. That to me is fascinating. Don't you think it's fascinating? Would be fascinating as a dynamic. Um, but um, again, again, one of the ways that I've been framing this in my work is by aspiration, in a positive sense, like 
it's a leadership act. It's, an, it's a positive thing when you speak up. It doesn't mean you're soft. It, this is why the term politically correct, that, as used in the United States by Donald Trump and others, is so damaging and destructive because in the moment you speak up and say, you know, stop being racist, stop acting out in racist ways, I don't appreciate that homophobic comment, I don't appreciate that, you go, well, you're just being politically correct, you're just being a white knight, as opposed to you're being a person of integrity who's actually strong and you should be respected for that rather than um, ridiculed for it. Yeah, great. Rebecca, you... Yeah, just to comment on that. Uh, I, well, I get for, the, like, the middle... <laughs> the men in between who don't know what to do, is they, get a, they have a feeling of discomfort. I see the problem, I don't know what to do. Women cannot carry that discomfort, but you can listen to women, what we have always done to get rid of the discomfort, and that is to act and to make a change, take a stand, stand with women, stand for women, be practical. You don't have to uh, start a company lecturing thousands of people. Uh, going to social media, read the comments on women's posts on social media. React when some other man says something degrading or violent or disrespectful to a woman. Just add something. I don't agree with you. What do you mean this is not respectful? Mm. If you keep doing that, you're making a huge change. And I'm going to promise you, you will feel better if you act than if you don't. Yeah, great. Thank you. Alan. I, I totally agree. And I think it's also about awareness because we tend to, as, as men, as, as a group, we tend to turn the other way because this is not about us, it's about them. You know, if you're white and this guy talking about racism, then you turn away. Well, it's okay, it's not about me. And I think we, we need to raise more awareness. I work a lot, like on the floor in schools, in, um, in elementary school, like high schools, and so on. And once I went into a class and, and they introduced me as a man and feminist, they started to boo, and they were like, oh, he's not a real man, he's like castrated, and so on. And after about, I, I think, I, I had some questions, I questioned them some, I gave them some questions and they couldn't answer and I started to talk about uh, like why is gender equality important and why the role of men in the process is so important and why we men need to like, you know, we need to actually fight for our own rights, for our own feelings, for our own being, you know, like we, we need to be free because we are not free because of these chains of destructive masculinity, you know? And uh, I mean, uh, Jackson told a lot about it, so I'm not gonna repeat that. And after the, the, the session when I was done and I asked him like, who wants to you know, work with gender equality? And, and I remember one guy, he stand up and he raised his hand like this, like, I wanna do it for myself, he said. <laughs> this guy and 16 other names I got from this class and 12 of them continued for 18 months to come to my office every Tuesday. Mm. And still today they are active in, within this field. Mm. So I think it's, it's doable, but we need to create awareness, but also we need to give men tools and a reason to why to do it. Uh -huh. And especially when I get this um, comment about like, oh, I mean, you know, I didn't ask for all these privileges, you know, I, you know, I didn't ask to be uh, born as a man, and I didn't want to say, okay, so you didn't ask for any of this, but how can you use those privileges to do change? Because you, are in, you can do the change, you know? You, you can use it. Like, we, we men, like, you know, it's a risk, but usually when it, we talk about men in traffic, in whatever, you know, we take a lot of risks. Yeah. So why should this be more different in other areas where we can actually do some positive things here? Yeah. Thank you. Actually, I, I, I was thinking, Ulf, of the monologue uh, before that uh, I think in the beginning, uh, of the monologue with all the kind of rage and, and power, display of power and the high voice. And then you, you change to a much more quieter and more introvert and the more the feelings inside. And I, I just was reflecting on that, what society sees of young men in, in, in uh, uh, violence around sports arenas is the first part. Mm -hmm. But we never really hear, hear in the public arena, we never really hear those feelings of self-contempt. Mm -hmm. Am I worth something? Mm -hmm. Can I live? Um, what, what, what should I do with my life? Um, I, was, I was wondering, is, is there, uh, um, is there a, a motivation for change in, in talking about that with your audiences when you do Top Boy? Yeah, I mean, we've had really good and deep discussions with people who are um, 
very deep in this kind of uh, destructive subculture, but also other uh, kind of uh, related uh, subcultures. And we have really good discussions because they're eager to talk about their feelings. They want to talk about their feelings, uh, but it's very difficult. But I think I see it a, a bit as addiction or if you have a, a, a drinking problem, I think a lot of people who, who have addiction problems, they have uh, downsides. They have, uh, when they start to kind of question themselves and they think they're useless and they think they just, you know, it, 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 kind of feeling sorry for themselves. And you either make a change or you just start drinking again to kind of, yeah. yeah. So that's, that's how I see in violence as well, that you, because violence is, is it's, uh, it's quite fun uh, to do. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's how a do big, you mean? I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a great kick uh, to, to be in a, in a proper fight. Of course, you... Uh, it's a feeling of being alive and it's a feeling of uh, putting yourself on the edge of what you can handle and whatever. I understand that feeling and I've, uh, I've, uh, I've enjoyed it as well. But it's like, I think it's like an addiction. It's like drinking. Uh, of course, they enjoy being drunk, but it's, uh, it's not good for them or, or for their surroundings. But either you make a change or you just do it even more. Yeah. And you have to kind of, you have to always have to raise the bar. So you always have to kind of, uh, and I think it's the same way in, in violence. And that's how it normally stops. Then it comes to uh, comes to a point where where you can't raise the bar anymore because then you either kill someone or you kill yourself or whatever. Uh, yeah. But uh, it works in the same way. And I think. When you feeling sorry for yourself and you questioning yourself, then you either make a change or you yeah. just do it even more. Okay, so so what I hear you saying is that um, uh, per men that use violence in part use it to handle an, their own anxiety. Yeah, definitely. And but I, it's and kind it's of connected. It's kind of connected to taking. They they release their anxiety by taking power over someone else, kind of. Yeah, yeah. definitely, definitely. They, they they feel empowered, so they they want to, or they feel unpowered. They don't have power over their life or their situation, so they take power as something they can control. But I would also yeah. say that using violence in this kind of environment is very much a self-destructive behavior. Yeah. And when we at Free Suicide, we work with people who leave. Uh, football gangs or, or, or other criminal gangs or uh, extremist organizations and, uh, and what we see is that when they cannot uh, use violence or express their hate uh, in the way that they're used to, a lot of them start harming themselves. They start, uh, like normal self-harm, they start cutting themselves or they get problems, uh, eating problems, they get eating disorders because they start to starve themselves. Because I would say for a lot of people, violence and, and hate is, is uh, self-harm kind of behavior. But yeah, it's kind can, of harming oneself by harming others. Yeah, and also putting uh, yourself, because a lot of people, uh, they just want to f get fucking hit in the face. Because then, you know, at least I'm, this hurts, so I don't have to focus okay. on this. Great. So it's... it's uh, Thank, thanks uh, for those remarks. And I think it, it's, get, it, it, it's actually one of the challenges, uh, s starting to understand the, the kind of mechanisms that goes on inside and still keeping the focus that this is a power system. And regardless how the perpetrator feels, it's not. Uh, it's it's it is a power position to use violence. So it gets tricky when we start listening to this, and we need to kind of keep things uh, straight uh, in the analysis from the outside. But it's important to to understand what goes on inside uh, for those guys and for those men. We only have a few minutes left, and I have some really important issues I'd like to bring up with you. And one of them is actually pornography, because. Um, Pornography on the internet is a huge industry today. And uh, it, a lot of the content is overtly misogynic, 
deeply sexist, and it actually sexual, sexualizes coercion and violence against women and girls. Uh, and one can really be worried and think about what are the implications of this, and uh, how is it possible that this is allowed to go on? Kind of in a, in a parallel universe every day for young people and for all people. Uh, Rebecca, would you like to speak <laughs> something to this? Yeah, sure. Uh, this is. Uh, we're used to at Unison to being the angry women, angry women's movement against pornography. So I'm very keen on hearing the men's uh, inputs as well. But uh, first of all, the implication is sexual violence, because we see a lot of effects from consuming pornography and the way pornography has taken over and living like its own parallel life on the internet, not uh, regulated in any way. And we see a lot of effects on sexual violence, of course, connected to consumption of pornography. But why it goes on, I would say two things. The first is that adult men keep watching pornography. Uh, it's an industry not held up by children. Children have access to it, unfortunately. Uh, but adult men are the main consumers of pornography. So if men just stop watching pornography, the industry would uh, <laughs> notice it. Uh, I think also uh, it's not that, it's, uh, it's uh, speaking like before, what can you do as a man and how can you make a change? That's one thing you can do. Stop watching pornography, tell your friends that you've stopped, ask them to stop and ask them why they won't stop if they won't. Why are they keen on watching sexual violence on documented uh, film? The other one is of course that the society is doing nothing uh, about this as well. Like we are living Very in a silent. time, as you said, it's, yeah, it's a, a huge silence. We are beginning to hear some reactions, uh, unfortunately, still mostly from NGOs and civil society. So we are uh, expectant, <laughs> and uh, we are expecting some um, reactions from political leadership and and government. And I think um, there has to be consequences of this. We cannot keep having internet as a Wild West, this is not a Wild West anymore. It's, it has formed its own society. Everyone is on the internet, and uh, we cannot keep pretending that we cannot make laws that affect the internet. We have laws for everything, because that's how we live together in a society, uh, to keep each other from harm. So why should that not be the case on the internet? Yeah. Uh, great, Rebecca, thanks. And, and, and uh, Jackson, would you like to comment on, on I mean, how can this just go on, having a huge industry that are pushing out uh, misogynic, sexist messages about violence against women and girls? Well, this, I mean, this, this is a really important question and really important conversation. I know we can't do it full justice in this space and time, but um, I think one of, the, one of the best developments conceptually and practically in thinking about how to address pornography is, you know, Gail Dines and her colleagues and others have been promoting the idea that, uh, that pornography is a public health crisis of the digital age. And by framing it as a public health issue rather than a morals issue, it takes out this discussion of are you pro-sex, are you anti-sex, and all this kind of silly discussion that people have, which then papers over and sort of denies the, the misogyny and the abuse. Then it just becomes about, it, it, in, in the mainstream conversation, so much of it is about are you repressed, are you prudish, versus are you, you know, you know, celebrating sexuality as if that's what the pornography industry does. The pornography industry has been very effective in selling itself as somehow sexual liberation or freedom, which is totally ridiculous. I mean, it's, it's Orwellian to, to call the pornography industry pro-sex. And it's, 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 it's distorted sexuality such that it's, it's, ca it's caused so much harm both to women and to men. And so I think by framing it that way, and I think the public health frame allows us to talk about the harms done not just to women but to men. And how many boys, like for example, how many boys and, he and heterosexual men's sexuality has been diminished? Their ability to form healthy sexual relationships has been diminished by their consumption of porn. That's an important angle as well because, because then you get men paying attention out of self-interest in addition to altruistic concern and compassion for the ha harm done by men towards women. It's also men are harming themselves and other men. And in that way, you're going to get men who are going to pay attention more than the, the claims about your responsibility to, you know, to, to women, which is important. I'm not saying you shouldn't talk about that. Um, it's important, but it's also important to talk about self-interest. Yeah. 
Yeah, great. But and I think you know this will certainly be one of the big issues the years to come. Yes. Because uh, the more we get aware of how how large the porn industry is and the messages that are being sent out, uh, society will have to do something about this. There's no question. Uh, our time is really up, you know, and uh, it's time for lunch. So I, I'd like to just uh, kind of conclude that, I, I mean, my idea was to work, talk a little bit about male leadership and engaging male leaders. And I think we can just uh, say that we, we have, a, it's been said already from the stage that we have a big lack of male political high leaders in nearly every country in, in the world. That they're not talking about this issue. They're not talking about men's violences and violence prevention. And this is something that we really need, I would say, from political leadership, especially men that are in leadership positions. If you agree, would you make a thumbs up? Great. How about the audience? <laughs> yeah, there we go. Message sent. <laughs> okay, so thank you so much to the, um, to the panel. Thank you, Josh. And thank all of you, and uh, have a good lunch and a good conference. See you in the corridors. Thank you.